couple minutes too. Hello to all of you who are joining us. Uh, our program will begin shortly. Welcome to you, those of you who are joining us. Our program will begin in about three minutes. Again, we'll get started in just two more minutes. All right, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Welcome, I'm Tanya Zanish Belcher, Director of Special Collections and Archives at Wake Forest University, which houses the North Carolina Baptist Historical Collection. Today's program is a collaboration between us, the Wake Forest Original Campus, and the Wake Forest Baptist Church, both located in Wake Forest, North Carolina. We are located in Winston-Salem. A final few housekeeping items before we get started. Today's program will be coming to you via a Zoom webinar. So while you will be able to see the speaker, they will not be able to see you. However, once Sean's presentation is finished, you will be able to submit questions via the chat or the Q&A boxes, and Dr. Sarah Solom will share them with Sean so he can respond. This presentation is being recorded and added to our YouTube channel, and we will share that link with you shortly. A special thank you to Rebecca Peterson May, Public Services Archivist here at Wake Forest for coordinating our technology today. Um, our speaker, Sean Price, will be sharing about his most recent book, Our Story of Faith, The History of Wake Forest Baptist Church. Sean's book is still available for purchase and we will be sure to share the link in the chat. Sean is a native of Williamston, North Carolina. He is a graduate of Campbell University, Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary, North Carolina Central University and the University of Aberdeen. In his career, Sean has worked as a college professor, a pastor and a missionary. He has been married to Joy for 14 years and they are expecting their fifth child in August, congratulations. They now serve as missionaries in Cardiff, Wales with the International Mission Board and he is joining us today from there. Sean, I'm gonna go ahead and turn this over to you. Okay, thank you, Tanya. Uh, well, good afternoon to everyone. It's certainly good to uh, have you here today and a uh, greeting from Cardiff. It's uh, a scorcher here, it's about 75 degrees and the locals here just think it's uh, ridiculously hot. Um, so I'm sure you see worse in, in North Carolina. Uh, so what I want to do today is uh, just kind of talk through the process of writing a history of uh, Wake Forest Baptist Church, uh, how this uh, book came about, and uh, then just share a bit uh, from the book. Uh, the church has a very uh, unique and uh, diverse history. Uh, so where I'll start is uh, how this book came about. Uh, so I moved to Wake Forest in 2013 um, after living in the UK for four years. I did a PhD at University of Aberdeen. Uh, my wife's from Raleigh. We previously lived in Wake Forest. So we're kind of moving back to home in many ways. And uh, I wanted to go to the really the closest Baptist church where we lived. Uh, the UK, I got used to walking to church. And so we were living close to Wake Forest uh, Baptist. And so that's where we, we ended up. Um, and having just finished a PhD, being involved in research, um, I came across the uh, Wake Forest History Committee. Uh, so 
I started attending those meetings maybe 2014 or so, and for a long time, uh, the church had, had wanted a book. Um, so it had a very rich history, uh, but just the right person had come along to um, write their history. Uh, so at these meetings, uh, we had one man in particular, uh, Doug Smith, who would come in with these uh, documents from the 1800s that were kind of stored in a plastic container somewhere, just uh, just amazing stuff that just wasn't being documented, wasn't being archived. And so I, I thought, you know, maybe this, maybe I'm the right guy for this uh, for this book. Uh, so I put my name forward. We talked through it, and we decided, you know what? Yes, it's time uh, to write this book. Uh, so I'll kind of begin with the challenges. So my training is in Christian ethics. Uh, it's not in history, so I'm not a church historian or a historian by training. Uh, so for me, there was quite a big learning curve. Uh, so there's a few things I had to learn approaching this book. First, I had to uh, get a grasp on uh, specifically North Carolina Baptist history. So North Carolina has its own particular uh, stream of history going there. Uh, I had to learn uh, about the culture of Wake Forest Baptist Church. Uh, and then just the history of um, what's going on there. In many ways, it's living history. Right? You have people there who've been in the church in some cases uh, 50, 60 years, who uh, lived through many of the stories that I document. And so I wanted to uh, treat that uh, fairly as well. Um, there's also the aspect that uh, this book was commissioned by the church. And so in some ways, I was accountable to a history committee. So anything I, I wrote kind of went through the committee for them to look at, from the give comments on, and then give feedback to me. Um, so it was a collaborative effort. Uh, there's a lot of people I'll talk about that I couldn't have uh, done it without. Um, so I think where I'll begin is uh, just talking through, where do you start, all right? So I have a committee here, I have a church saying, yes, we want a book. We want a history of our church. Um, so where do you start? Uh, Wake Forest is quite unique in that there is a treasure trove of documents if you know where to look, all right? So as a researcher, you start looking. Uh, so the first place I began was the church minutes. And so Wake Forest Baptist Church was founded in 1835. And so they have minutes uh, back until that date. Um, so one thing we'll talk through is uh, since I began writing this book, a lot of the church documents have now been digitized, so they're available through um, Wake Forest University Special Collections. But at the time, um, I had a minute book, you know, this 175-year-old book. Um, there were two copies of microfilm, so one was housed at Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary, and there's a microfilm copy at uh, Wake Forest University as well. And that's it, right? <laughs> so quite often, I just have to go to the church unlock this case that has the minute book, take the minute book out and read it. So I started there just reading uh, the minute book. And so one thing I wanna do in this lecture, especially with some of the early documents is just give you a feel of, you know, what am I looking at? Um, so I'm gonna pull up um, a document that begins the um, Wake Forest history minute book. And this is from August, 1835. So I'm gonna share um, that document with you. Make sure I get the right one. Okay. So this is the first entry in the Wake Forest Baptist Minute Book. And I'll just begin by reading this. So compared to some of the authors I came upon, the handwriting isn't too bad. So this was another issue sometimes with some of the documents I have these uh, handwritten sources and have to figure out, you know, what are they saying, um, especially if I'm trying to uh, quote it and quote it well. Um, so I'll read this best of my ability. Uh, it says the religious part of the members of the Institute, uh, this was the Wake Forest Manual Labor Training Institute, which is the name of the time, um, would tend more to promote uh, their knowledge of um, religion, uh, thus advancement in spiritual things and the purity of the character as Christians and followers of the Blessed Redeemer to have a church constituted at this place obtained letters of dismission from their respective churches and were constituted a church by the Reverend Samuel Waite on the last Sabbath in August. 
after the constitution of the church, it was deemed expedient to elect such officers as are usually attached to churches for their government. Accordingly, the Reverend Samuel Waite was chosen pastor of the church, uh, which appointed meant he accepted on condition that the Reverend John Armstrong should be appointed uh, assistant pastor, which was agreed to. George Washington elected clerk and Robert M. Knoxon treasurer. The election of deacons was uh, delayed until the next church meeting. Um, you then have a list of the first members of the church. And so just to think through the uh, uniqueness of this church. So uh, we have the Wake Forest Manual Labor Training Institute. So you have students here. And the church was really birthed out of what's known as the uh, Second Great Awakening. Uh, and at this time, you have quite a few uh, camp meetings taking place uh, throughout the country. And these camp meetings, the idea really was to promote uh, a type of revivalism. Um, so they um, kind of put the means in place called human means to promote a sense of revival. And so you had some students going to these camp meetings um, and feeling the religious fervor of the time. Um, and then we had one who came back who was converted. And this began what was uh, seen as sort of a mini revival um, on the campus of um, Wake Forest. Uh, and one of the instrumental figures this time was William Tell Brooks. Uh, so Brooks was a student um, at the beginning of the Institute. He was a bit older than his classmates. So he was, uh, I think about 24 when he enrolled in 1834. Um, so he was seen as sort of a uh, senior leading figure among the students. And very early on, uh, from what I can tell reading his journals is he was a very devout um, Christian. Um, so my first source was the church minutes. Uh, my next source was certainly uh, looking at the archives of Wake Forest University. So I was immensely impressed <laughs> whenever I came across, um, for instance, William Tell Brooks or Samuel Waite, um, just the amount of uh, material that was available. So for Brooks, I came across a journal that he kept during this time. Um, so I saw this journal mentioned in uh, George Washington Paschal's uh, three-volume history of Wake Forest College. Um, so he would refer to Brooks's journal. So I said, what is this journal? Where do I find it? So um, the journal, the original copy is still held by uh, Wake Forest University. Um, I don't know that it has been officially digitized uh, yet. Um, so they have the original copy, but um, probably 2016 or so, I asked, I believe, Rebecca to uh, make me a copy of it. So I have a digital copy of it. So I just want to show you um, some of the uh, entries that he has during this time, just to get a sense of what's happening on campus. So this is from uh, Brooks's journal. Let's see. And so that entry that I just read from Wake Forest uh, Baptist becoming a church was the 30th of August. So we're going to back up a bit to the 18th of August. So the term is in session, and here is what Brooks says. Um, and again, Brooks's handwriting is a step down <laughs> from the church clerk, I think. But I'll try to read this to you. Uh, met this evening in the chapel for prayers. Uh, this meeting was held in consequence of W. Yancey's returning from the camp meeting. Uh, professing a hope in Christ, the Savior of sinners. This meeting, we firmly believe, has been beneficial uh, to our souls, not only those who have a hope in Christ, but those who are not yet in the gall of bitterness and hints of iniquity. So the idea here is he's saying we have somebody who's converted. We are praying for others here to be converted as well. Um, we believe from the let's see, signs of the times that the Lord will pour out a blessing. And then he continues a prayer there. So here the 18th of August, we have one student, um, W. Yancey, who goes to a camp meeting. Um, this probably takes place in Granville County. That's where Paschal Sites is taking place. So a very rural area. We have revivalism. He comes back. He says, I profess hope in Christ. Right. It's the 18th. I'm going to skip down a bit. Um, we have a few other entries from Brooks here. Uh, this is Wednesday, so going from I believe it's Tuesday, the next day, Wednesday. Uh, met in the chapel for prayers. Um, let's see. 
And he says, um, for prayer, and it's a considerable anxiety manifest among the students to seek salvation of their souls. Um, so Wednesday, we have prayer, we have preaching. Thursday, they're assembling again for prayer, for preaching. We have a guy named Brother Dennis, he's preaching to them. Um, we then have uh, some salvation experiences. So he continues uh, naming two or three others. So um, let's see, here I'm going to read where it says Sabbath at night, attending prayer meeting, the excitement still high, two or three of the students profess a hope in Christ. You see that at the very top um, of the page there. And by the end, you have close to a dozen students who are converted. Uh, so there's certainly a sense of revival on campus. Um, so the early students at Wake Forest uh, Manual Labor Institute um, were not all going there for ministerial training. So you had sort of a mix here. You had some families with money sending their kids to get an education. You had others going for training. And so you have these young, zealous students uh, who are praying for their classmates to uh, be converted. And then you have it happening. And so you do have a tangible sense of revival um, on campus in the early days. And the result of this is the formation of a separate church. So the closest church was uh, Wake Union Chapel, which um, I think it may be a mile and a half to two miles from campus, something like that. Um, and so they were walking every Sunday, going to church, or sometimes a bit on Saturday, actually, the, cha the chapel was shared by several different denominations. And so the decision was made to establish a separate church on the campus. Um, another aspect of this kind of revival at the time was prayer. Uh, something you see throughout Brooks's journal is the mention of prayer. Um, I'm going to read just briefly here. I really like this entry um, where it says, Monday morning, uh, the brethren, and by brethren, I, I think he means the um, you know, students who are praying for revival here, built a little Bethel in a secret spot in uh, order that they might retire and pray for their fellow students who were uh, mourning the love of God to know. And we can say of a truth on the following night that the Lord was pleased to help us in a very particular manner. Uh, so the word Bethel means kind of house of God or place of God. So the idea is these students are going probably in the woods somewhere and have set up this uh, place to pray. Um, so you have prayer accompanying the revival. Um, and then the last thing I'll show you from Brooks's journal is he just mentions, uh, if I can find it, he does talk uh, in here in depth on um, the constituting of Wake Forest Baptist Church. So we have the minutes as well as Brooks's diary showing kind of the um, tone of what's happening here. So here's the entry, maybe perhaps don't read the whole thing for sake of time. Um, Let's see, I'll start. It's about one, two, three, four, five, six lines down. It says, Reverend Professor Waite constituted us a church. Uh, his charge to us was truly affecting. He had no doubt the importance of, of thing at heart. After we were constituted, we called Reverend Professor Waite to be our pastor. He, with great love and affection, um, I'm not sure he says they are appointed brother of George Washington, clerk, et cetera, et cetera. And so here you have this uh, kind of primary source. Let's stop the share there. Um, so as far as what I'm using to write the book, I'm using stuff like this, uh, Brooks's journal, where I'm trying to decipher what's being said. Um, in addition, with Samuel Waite, I looked at a lot of his primary letters. So he's writing about, you know, early on the possibility of moving to Wake Forest. Um, he's writing back to... Um, family up north, just about what's happening on campus. Um, so I have the minutes. I have my sources at Wake Forest University. A third source I relied on quite heavily was the Biblical Recorder. Um, so the Biblical Recorder, uh, all their materials digitized. Um, so quite often there was something happening in the minutes book. Um, I would check what's going on in the Biblical Recorder. So Wake Forest uh, comes up a lot there. It's kind of a center of Baptist activity in the state as the years progress. Um, so I'm kind of comparing what's going on between those two. So in 1835, there's several accounts in the biblical recorder of this revival, um, what's happening on campus. And so the state is becoming aware uh, of this new college um, that's birthed out of revival of a church that comes out of 
um, this revival as well. Uh, so that's kind of the early days. Uh, so what I'm trying to do to write this book is bring all these materials together. So I have Pascal, I have the minutes, I have these primary sources at Wake Forest University, I have the biblical recorder. Uh, and then I'm thinking through um, how to organize the material. And so I did it partly by pastorate. So every pastor kind of had a unique um, tone or aspect uh, that they brought to the church. And because the early pastors were also presidents of Wake, Col Wake Forest College, um, there was a lot written about them as well. So they had um, colleagues they were writing to, um, often I'd find obituaries about the presidents, about the pastors, um, just to get a better feel for um, who they were as individuals. Uh, I'm gonna share just one of those. Since we have talked about uh, William Brooks, I'll just share a bit more um, about him. Uh, so here's a picture of Brooks uh, later in age. So he did serve for um, a brief period um, as pastor, kind of between pastors of Wake Forest Baptist. Um, he had a long pastorate at Forestville Baptist Church, which is uh, sort of down the road uh, from Wake Forest. Um, and I'll just show you kind of interesting um, entry uh, from his time period. Let me find the right page here. Zoom out a bit. Um, so this is how, I guess, obituaries go in the late 19th century. I thought this is an almost comical way to start an obituary. Uh, for many years, the friends and acquaintances <coughs> of Dr. Brooks had expected to hear that he was dead. Uh, for the last six years, he's been an invalid, confined to his house, most of the time confined to bed. So we're kind of expecting this to happen. Um, kind of a sad testament here. The second paragraph uh, says, when we first saw him, he was a frail, worn-out preacher. Uh, never, we presume, a robust person, disease and toil make rapid inroads upon his constitution. And at 60, he was a wreck, broken at the mercy of many diseases. He had been himself expecting to die for years. So not quite the same way we write obituaries nowadays. Uh, so the way these tend to start is um, they work through, all right, so here are some possible um, character faults in Brooks, um, but also... As it goes on, it talks about how he dealt with his infirmity with great courage in later life and about how much the college meant to him and he meant to the college. Um, so there we have Brooks. Um, a few other things I just want to share um, that are particular about Wake Forest Baptist Church. Um, because of its uh, kind of early uh, founding as a church in revival, um, there was certainly a focus on mission. Uh, the first uh, missionary to uh, China from the Baptist Convention came out of Wake Forest Baptist Church. Um, that was uh, Matthew Tyson Yates. And so Yates served for um, 40 years in China. And most of the minutes are, you know, kind of dry when you read through church minutes. But every now and then you can find a little bit of fun in there. Um, so I guess for a story, this is kind of fun. So uh, Yates uh, took for his um, wife a Presbyterian. Uh, so this can cause a bit of a, you know issue at the time. So we have Yates uh, wanting to go overseas, wanting to sure, serve as a missionary. Um, he's being supported by several sources. Uh, so um, for instance, today in the Southern Baptist Convention, so I serve as a missionary of the convention. And so I'm supported by the what's called cooperative program. So every Southern Baptist church gives a small percentage of their funds. And so I'm fully supported and don't have to worry too much about, you know, where my rent's going to come from. Um, so it's quite different for Yates. So he's supported by the local church. He also was supported by the Raleigh Baptist Convention initially, uh, and then the state convention, and then by the denomination. Um, so working out, you know, how to get his funds in place was a bit more of an issue back then. And so he wasn't going to go at all if he was married to a Presbyterian. Uh, so when you read the Wake Forest Baptist Minutes, there's a short entry that says um, we took, uh, I believe her name was Eliza, Eliza Morning Yates, 
um, into uh, baptism. We baptized her as, a, as a, a member of the church, and then immediately we commissioned them as missionaries. All right, so they checked the box. Um, they're okay to go off as uh, missionaries um, as well. And so, again, with these primary sources, there's a file on, um, there's a box at Wake Forest University on Matthew Yates. Um, and I found a pretty moving letter where he's on the boat to Shanghai. Uh, so he's on his way. Um, who knows if he'll ever come back again to America. And he writes back just saying, you know, keep me updated uh, about news on the hill is what he called it. So kind of the, obviously, if you've been to Wake Forest campus, kind of up high. So he wants to hear back what's happening at Wake Forest. So he had a deep love throughout his life for the college um, and the church and kept that connection uh, throughout the rest of his life. Um, a few other things I want to talk about, I do want to leave plenty of time just for Q&A, just anything we want to discuss in the book, is um, Wake Forest is also unique in that um, there were several times in its life where uh, they had to expand, but there's really nowhere to expand. Uh, so the first building on the campus uh, was built around 1910 to 1915. Uh, that reigned to the um, church met on the college campus for the first, is that 75 years? So they didn't have a building. Um, there was a move by the pastor at the time, um, Walter Johnson, to uh, build a building. Um, so initially, uh, most of the students, uh, most of the members of the church were students. Um, the first uh, batch from the minutes I showed you earlier were all students. The first deacons were students. And so this was a student church in many ways. About 75 years on, um, you certainly still have a large student population, but you also have students and others from the community who have joined. It's become an established church in some ways, and it really is time um, for them to have their own building. Um, but there is a uh, question of finance. Uh, in 1911, uh, the church had $86.89 in its treasury, okay? So not exactly bursting at the seams. Uh, just think about how much money you gave to church when you were in, in college. Um, I didn't make a lot, so I gave a little bit. Uh, so they didn't have a lot of money, right? Um, but they had plans to build a pretty expansive building. Really, um, Walter Johnson had these plans. And so he put forward a plan to build. Um, initially, he thought it would cost $40,000, right? So that was his estimation. So they have $86. He's thinking $40,000. Uh, in the end, it costs over $70,000, right? Uh, so uh, the way he does this really is by um, pushing the town of Wake Forest to give money, uh, pushing alumni who um, have fond memories of the church quite often, as well as pushing the state. And in the end, uh, the state gives part, uh, the church gives part, and um, the Raleigh Baptist Association gives part of the money. And the land, all right? So the church has met on the campus. They don't have their own building, right? They don't have their own land. And so what happens is Wake Forest College gives a portion of land for them uh, to build uh, their church. And something that comes out later in the history is what's called a reverter clause. So I've looked at the original deeds for this original piece of land, and it says, if this church ever ceases to function as a uh, Baptist church, the land will revert to Wake Forest College. And so certainly the members at the time did not see that as an issue, right? Um, if this isn't a Christian Baptist church, then it's going to be given back to the college, right? So that's 1915 uh, is finished. Uh, we then have a couple of other building additions to the church. Um, and there was one in particular that caused a possible issue that's worth talking through. Um, I believe it was 1956. Um, we have an education wing added to the church. All right. So again, they can't expand. They're landlocked. So they approach uh, Wake Forest. It was a little bit earlier in 1956. So the college left about then. So a bit earlier, they approached um, and said, "We can we buy some land from you? It was sold for $1 to go to education wing. Uh, but this time it said, um, if this church ceases to be a Southern Baptist church, uh, then this land will revert back to the college. Uh, again, that doesn't seem to be an issue until you get to the late 80s 
early 90s. And so at this time in Baptist history in North Carolina, um, you have uh, what's sometimes called the conservative takeover. Um, so at Southeastern, you have the Board of Trustees sort of changing hands. You have the Quattro Baptist Fellowship forming, and you have real concerns uh, from at least some members that, you know, are they going to take our building? <laughs> um, there was never any indication I can find that the conservatives had any intention of doing this, but you could understand the, um, the sense of alarm, right? So you have a uh, faculty member leaving um, Southeastern in droves in the late 80s, uh, and then this is coming up um, quite a bit. Um, so where does this, where does this end? Uh, kind of where does this go at the time? Um, well, there's a few solutions that are offered. Uh, first, um, again, the conservatives have never said we're going to do this, but uh, Wake Forest Baptist gives, uh, I believe it's $250 a year to remain part of the Southern Baptist Convention. So all you have to do to be a part of the SBC is give sort of a nominal um, amount of money in your main kind of SBC. Um, but kind of looking to the future, uh, when we get to uh, Bill Slater's tenure, so he came in 2005, uh, Danny Aiken, the current president of Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary came in 2004, um, they formed a very uh, friendly relation, uh, which was quite different from the seminary church relations in kind of the late 80s, um, early 90s. Uh, and again, Wake Forest Baptist Church is at the point that it's landlocked. They want to build again. Um, what are they going to do? <laughs> uh, so uh, they approached Southeastern, and uh, Southeastern offered to um, sell them the land for $1 to build an education wing. Um, so this time there was no reverter clause, right? So in this deed, there's nothing saying we're ever going to take this building from you. So I think uh, in many ways that was a good will gesture on the part of the seminary to um, say, basically, we're going to give you this land, use it for what you will for the furtherance of the gospel um, here in Wake Forest. Um, so a final source that was quite helpful in thinking through how to write this history was simply meeting with people. Um, so what I tried to do was um, meet with people who lived through this history. Right? So early on, I met with uh, Tom Jackson, who was the uh, pastor of the church up until 2004, I forget what year he arrived, around uh, 88 or so, um, so if it were you know, 16 years, so I met with Tom, got to know him, and just heard from him um, about the church, uh, why this was an important church, why this was a historic church, and um, what the future held. I tried to meet with many of the um, older members uh, of the church um, who had been there, who had kind of lived through this history and had stories to tell. Uh, so something I came to uh, realize early on is um, I'm the one telling the story of this church, but it's not my story. Right? It's the story of the people who lived, who gave, who sacrificed, and who had a vested interest um, in this story. And so one thing that I certainly appreciated was uh, going back to where I started with the history committee. So we had people who really cared about the history, um, who wanted the story told, and who lived a lot of this history. And so just talking to them, hearing from them, getting feedback on what to include, what not to include. Um, so there was a couple of things I found really interesting that uh, maybe the history committee didn't find as interesting. Uh, I remember there's one case where um, one of the first members, a guy named Robert Knoxon. Um, so I think he was the first treasurer of the church. Um, so when he moved away, away from Wake Forest, he moved to Washington, D.C., um, went to, I believe, Columbian College for a master's degree. Um, and so the folks at Wake Forest were checking on him. Um, and uh, the uh, president of Columbian College saying, well, he's not going to church up here. <laughs> so they started sending letters, uh, checking in on him. Uh, he moved back to North Carolina eventually. And so we have, I uh, forget how long it is, seven, eight, nine years where his name just keeps coming up over and over. Um, and eventually he's put in church discipline for basically lack of church attendance until finally he's removed from the church roles. So this is really interesting to me, you know, kind of digging down these kind of rabbit holes, finding out what happened to this guy. I found out, you know, where he ended up moving to, where he died. But it's really a kind of side issue of the church, right? So I could have taken eight, nine pages worth about this, but, you know, that's not really the heart of the church. It's a rabbit hole. So one thing I found is easy, was really easy to 
um, just spend my day looking at these kind of, again, rabbit holes that maybe don't have a lot of relevance to the history of the church. So um, I did have to kind of hone that down, um, do my best to stay on task with um, what's happening um, in the life of the church. Uh, I'm going to stop my share here. I've been on share too long. Uh, one other person I want to show you um, is just a picture of Washington Manley Wingate. Um, so he was a uh, pastor during, did I share it? Yes, during the Civil War. And I found one really interesting entry about him in the, uh, after the Civil War. Uh, so he was, um, by most accounts, a very... Um, maybe spiritual is the right word, a very deep, affecting uh, type of person. Um, I really like this picture. You know, he has this kind of dark stare, but he was seen as a very kind of gentle um, person by those who know, knew him. So I showed you earlier that account of William Tell Brooks, you know, where they're saying, you know, by 60, he was a wrecked man. Um, so Wingate served as the president of Wake Forest College for, I believe, over two decades. And I found a tribute to him that's about 20 pages long after his death, written by several people in the college. Um, and so after uh, the Civil War was over, um, so he was very much in favor of the Southern cause. Uh, that's kind of a separate issue, probably for another um, webinar. Uh, but apparently he went in his office, spent the day in prayer and um, resigned to the defeat. But there's an ent uh, entry in the minute book, which um, you know, he's, you know, lost money, he's lost land, uh, he's in some ways financially wrecked, the church is financially wrecked as well, so um, with students, basically the college being closed, so they don't have any income really to pay him, uh, so in 1865 or so, he's paid with 12 bushels of corn, right, so this is all the church can give him, so that's sort of what he gets, he makes it through this, um, so just a very important figure um, in the life of the church. Um, I think I'll share at least one, two more stories. I'll share two more stories and we'll have a Q&A. Uh, so just on the subject of uh, race relations. So when you read through the minutes, um, early on, you do have um, uh, black members of the church. Uh, at Wake Forest Baptist Church. You have them listed. Um, sometimes they're listed by their name as well as who owns them. Um, at the close of the Civil War, you have a, a break, as in many Baptist churches throughout the South, um, where you have a separate church joining. And the result of this, obviously, is that the uh, white members were not content with um, now African Americans having equal status in their congregation. Um, so you have a break. Um, it seems this was done pretty well at Wake Forest, as far as I can tell from reading the primary sources. Um, Wake Forest Baptist uh, members, pastors, deacons did try to offer support to establish a separate church. Um, so you have Olive Branch Baptist Church is what it becomes. Um, now, you don't have another um, um, black member of the church until about 1962. And um, I say black rather than African-American because um, what you have are two um, Ghanan students at Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary. And this is a bit of irony uh, in history, I think, in that you have Southern Baptist missions. Uh, so Baptists in America have always been mission-minded. Um, and so they are preaching in other nations in Africa. And so you have two men who are mature, who have served as pastors in Ghana, um, who are now coming, uh, who've been under basically Baptist influence in Ghana, who are coming to study at Southeastern to earn a degree from a Baptist uh, seminary. Um, so the question was, you know, what to do uh, with these two students? And so I came across a memoir um, by Luther Copeland. So Luther Copeland was a longtime missionary, and then he taught missions at Southeastern. Um, he seemed to be, uh, you know, quite the, quite the character. Uh, so he titled his memoir, Memoirs of a Geezer. So he wrote this kind of later in his life. And he gives an account of kind of what happens with these um, two Ghanan men. So they want to join a Baptist church. 
Um, so what um, President Staley uh, says is, well, why don't we start by taking them to Pullen Memorial Baptist Church and um, I believe it was yes, Binkley Memorial Baptist in Chapel Hill. So those were seen as more progressive churches at the time, um, more open to what's happening in race relations. Uh, let's go there. And so the students go there. They go to a morning service at Pullen Memorial, uh, an afternoon service at Binkley Memorial. And they're very much affirmed, welcomed, accepted, um, but they don't really want to drive 30 minutes to go to church, right? So they say we, we prefer to go to um, Wake Forest Baptist Church. So what are we going to do with this? And uh, in Brooks's memoir, so it's put forward um, to, uh, you know, let these students join the church. And uh, Copeland writes, um, all hell breaks loose <laughs> at this meeting. Uh, must have been quite the uh, Baptist church meeting to be at. And so you have one faction saying, well, um, we don't want um, uh, any African-Americans or Blacks to join the church. You have another faction saying, uh, well, in the spirit of Christ, our doors should be open to all. Um, so what are you going to do here? And at one point, someone offered a um, compromise position of uh, what if we only allowed um, students who are associated or people who are associated with Southeastern Seminary to join, all right? So that way they're saying, we're not going to allow local African-Americans to join, but if they're in training, we'll allow them to join. That was shot down when someone brought up, well, what about the groundskeepers, right? So again, you have the segregationist mindset kind of working through that. And one way this ended, I think, is very much a watershed moment. Um, so you have uh, this older member, um, Dr. Cullum. So Dr. Cullum spent his life at uh, Wake Forest College. Um, it's 1962. He's now 95 years old, right? So he is kind of the old saint of the church. And he gets up and gives kind of this um, address to the church. I'll just read from the book. He says, um, occasion to Negroes from Ghana applying for membership in Wake Forest Baptist Church. We are fully committed to the principle that every human being is made in the image of God and therefore is treated with the highest respect regardless of color with no distinction as superior and inferior. We deliberately therefore endorse the contention of the National Council of Churches as reported in Christian Century that racism is a religion competing with the Christian faith diametrically opposed to it. Therefore, we are hardly in favor of receiving into our church these men and any other persons, regardless of color or race, who give credible evidence of conversion and loyalty to the principles we believe in. So I'm just encouraged by this 95-year-old man standing up and giving this testament of faith. And so uh, Wake Forest Baptist was indeed on the right side of history um, on this issue. And um, Dr. Cullum died the following year, 1963. See, maybe it's the end of that year, end of 1963. So it's kind of one of the last uh, things that he did in ministry was to stand up for um, equality uh, in church membership. Um, this did result in a uh, church split. So you did have some families who left, um, started a separate church. Um, but just a testament of, you know, God's grace working through um, Dr. Cullum in old age here. Um, so you have quite a few stories like that in the book where, um, I wouldn't say they'd be forgotten, but they just kind of be anecdotal stories told by some church members. And so it was um, a testament, I think, to the Tyler's work of the uh, History Committee to want this book to be written and just to have a testament, right? 20, 25, 50 years from now, to be able to read these stories um, and remember the history of this um, local church. Um, so I've been talking for 45 minutes, so I think it's probably a good place for uh, Q&A. So I'll hand it, uh, I guess, back to Tanya, and we can um, open up for discussion. Sarah. Actually, Sarah is going to take over here, and there she is. I'm going to earn my keep today. Sean, thank you so much for talking about your experiences writing this book. As I told you earlier, I have really enjoyed um, reading it. Uh, I feel like I'm always going back, rereading chapters, um, just, to, just to kind of understand how you went through the minutes. Um, I, we at the museum are just so indebted to your research and the whole Histories Committee at Wake Forest Baptist Church. Um, you help us do our work. 
So I'm gonna open up the floor to questions. If anyone would like to ask Sean a question about maybe a section in the book that you've read or you had questions about, or maybe about something that he said tonight, if you haven't had a chance to read the book, um, you can pop it in the chat or in the Q&A. So I'm gonna, while that, while we take a, a few minutes to let people type in their questions, I do, I mean, I have many, but um, one of the things just kind of following up with your most recent story you mentioned, um, I would love to hear a little bit more about the enslaved members of the church before the Civil War. And actually one of my favorite parts of your book is talking about the split between white and black congregants right after the Civil War and wondering kind of what sources did you use? I, I my sense is that was a challenging, um, that was a challenging section to write. And I just would love to, to hear more about that. Yeah, sure. So, um, you know, part of what I tried to do is, you know, just look at what it, what's happening at other churches um, during this time. And so if you drive through, you know, a lot of southern towns. Um, so, for instance, I taught at um, Lewisburg College for a while. I believe Lewisburg has two Lewisburg Baptist churches, right? So you have a um, black and a white um, Baptist church. And so this was seemed to be the common practice uh, for this split to happen. Um, I do think there was a sense of empowerment uh, for many African American um, individuals. Um, so just reading the minutes, um, I didn't pick up on any uh, direct animosity from the minutes as far as directed at um, the African American members. Um, I do wonder if there was a sense of paternalism at times, um, as far as um, they did provide oversight for some time as they established their own church. I don't know if it was paternalism or them simply um, helping to establish this church as a separate congregation. It's hard for me to say um, in that regard. Um, there was uh, one instance in which, um, let's see, I'm thinking back. So one of Samuel Waite's uh, slaves was a member of the church. Um, and she requested dismission from this local church. I believe she went to, to Raleigh eventually. And so I do see the sense of empowerment that I don't have to go to your church <laughs> anymore. Um, I can worship in you know, a separate church in the way that I choose. And so, um, yeah, I appreciate that. No, thank you for that. Yeah, she went to, that was Dicey, right? First Baptist? Yes, in Dicey. Raleigh? Yeah, wonderful. Um, Hallie asks, can you talk a little bit about women's role in the church um, as deacons and how maybe women's leadership and roles in the church change throughout its history? Yeah, sure, I'd be happy to. Uh, so Wake Forest Baptist has some of the earliest, um, as far as I know, documented uh, deaconesses in Baptist life in North Carolina. Uh, so this is happening kind of the late uh, 1920s. So you have a separate role um, for a deaconess. And there was certainly pushback. I remember reading uh, some articles by Dr. Paschal at the time where he is uh, defending this practice of having a deaconess. So even then you had sort of the very conservative wing saying that um, this uh, isn't an office we should have in our local church. Um, so early on, the church is saying that women have an important role. And I think part of the impetus for that certainly is um, you do have a very well-educated clergy at Wake Forest uh, Baptist Church that's been kind of throughout its history to today quite often, um, at least the D-men, Doctor of Ministry, if not a PhD. Um, so you do have the clergy kind of um, uh, saying that we want, uh, you know, well-educated uh, laity as well. Um, so from 1920s, you have uh, deaconesses, um, I believe around the 19... Uh, 60s, Hallie Klein is better than me, honestly, about this, uh, when we have um, our first kind of, uh, associate uh, ministers brought in who are women. Uh, Kay Cook served, uh, from what I've been told from members, from late 70s to, I believe, 88 or so as kind of um, a force at the church. She was, in many ways, what held the church together uh, during that time period um, and very much saw the role of women in ministry as being um, uh, vital. Um, I think the day will come when Wake Forest Baptist will have a female uh, senior pastor, um, and I think that would be a good thing for the church, as um, I think the ethos of the church does see itself as being progressive on uh, women's issues, so um, 
Dr. Slater is retiring soon, so that could be, I don't know, the discussions may be happening right now, I, I really don't know. Um, so my answer to that question would be like, I'm appreciative of the way the church has consistently seen um, a vital role for women in ministry. And uh, so the church today is primarily aligned with the Proctor Baptist Fellowship, and that's uh, been from its founding days in the early 90s, um, part of one of its primary uh, impetuses is letting women feel empowered um, in ministry. Thank you. Please feel free to send in more questions, but I will keep going and until more come in here. Um, I guess one of my questions, you spoke about this throughout your conversation is about the importance of sitting down and talking with people, hearing their stories, um, kind of the, the oral history um, part of your research. But I'm just wondering, did that ever, that's my favorite part of doing research. And did you ever find, you know, slight contradictions from the the primary sources, the written sources versus the primary sources that oral history is sitting, how people remembered versus what you're reading in the documents and what you're interpreting there. Um, I'm always interested in that space between, you know, the written record and then the, the oral record. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, something I didn't want to do is uh, just have anecdotal stories throughout the book. Um, so the, I think there's an important place for anecdotal stories but I really wanted a research book so that you know, 50 years from now, we could look up these sources that I'm citing and say, okay, this is um, where this happened. Um, I think the way that came out more kind of anecdotal you know, memory versus what I'm finding documented, um, probably were in times of controversy where um, you know, a minister has resigned um, and there's hard, there was some hard feelings at the time or they didn't do things the way that we thought they should do them, or um, I don't know, maybe there was division. So I'm thinking of um, a few examples. So we had a church uh, that kind of broke off in the early 2000s um, with uh, Dick and Ginger Graves. And so in many ways there's hard feelings they left. So Dick, I believe was the associate, uh, Ginger was the minister of music. And so they basically started a separate church in Lake Forest. Um, and so I'm talking to people that this is, you know, you know, 12, 13 years prior, it's not that long ago. Uh, and these are people still in the community. Um, so I want to be careful in the way that I write about them. <laughs> I want to be uh, generous, um, but also truthful. And so usually what I did was I started with, you know, what is my primary source? Um, is this a reliable source? Um, and how does this compare to those I'm talking to. Um, another good example is um, I Beverly Lake. Um, so he was a longtime member of the church. He was uh, very much the leader in the segregationist faction of Wake Forest Baptist Church in the 60s. Um, interestingly, he, ne he never uh, removed his membership from the church. So he kept a fondness there. Um, but you have descendants of Lake, you know, uh, you, you have uh, some oral histories about him. And you have a lot of good things he did at the church. Uh, so there's a part of him that you know, loved the church, loved the Lord, but the segregation uh, mentality was ingrained in him as it was many at the time. And so I'm trying to, to walk the balance between honoring him as an individual um, and, and trying my best to be an objective historian. Right? Thank you for that. Yes, and local history, right? To when you, when you have people who are living this history. Um, and this is a church that is constantly evolving and changing. Um, and what, do you have any remarks or just comments on just reflecting back on your research? But I think about Wake Forest Baptist Church, it has a rich history, all of branches connected to it. Um, Forestville Baptist Church has connections, Wake Union, Friendship. Um, and how much do all of these other churches, I know that they were not the core subject, but how did your, how did you manage all of these different connections when you have just this central um, church that has sparked all of these other congregations? Yeah, sure. So um, I was commissioned to write the history of one church. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I tried to focus on, on this one. I did reach out to some of these other churches. I reached out to Olive Branch and just talked to them a little bit um, just about their history and their connections. Um, and I would say that, you know, Bill Slater, the current pastor of Wake Forest Baptist, you know, he's been there for 
let's see, I guess 17 years. Um, and so something that's been part of his pastorate very much is having an ecumenical spirit. So he's really tried to have friendly relations with other um, local churches and communities. Um, now with, with your question, some of these churches, for instance, like Wake Union, um, so they had microfilm at Wake Forest University. So I did look through their microfilm at different times to see what's happening here. Um, I looked for things like the transfer of membership of Matthew Yates um, to Wake Forest Baptist, as well as a few others. Um, so it was helpful to see what else is happening on the landscape um, at the time. Um, and again, I'm writing this book, um, you know, kind of as a part-time job slash hobby. So I was commissioned to write it. Um, but this type of thing, you know, as you know, <laughs> Sarah, with the PhD research, um, it can be all consuming. And so I could learn everything about Friendship Baptist and Olive Branch Baptist. Um, but I do have to think, you know, how much relevance, what, what are my, um, where do I cut um, and where do I focus? So. Yeah, my thought having read your book is that you're probably an expert on all of these churches at this point, but we only see snippets, snippets of it in the book. Um, so I, well, we're still waiting for some more questions to come in. Maybe you're, you know, you just answered everyone's questions about the book during your presentation. Um, but would you, are you interested in writing another congregation history be, uh, in the future? Uh, has this sparked a, a passion for you or? That's a really good question. Um... I've had one or two churches reach out to me, and my first question for them is, what sources do you have? Because <laughs> I think if I, I would definitely be open to writing another church history. Um, it really is a unique type of writing. So um, my undergrads from Campbell University, my church history professor there was Glenn Jonas, who wrote um, First Baptist Raleigh. And so I con conversed with Glenn throughout the writing of this book. And so it is a very unique thing because you're dealing with uh, people who love their local church. You're also dealing with history at large. You're dealing with all these fun little stories that are unique to just that congregation. Um, so um, I was very fortunate just the amount of resources <laughs> of able to write this book. Um, so I don't think I would have that much writing another church history. Um, so I would be open if it's kind of the right church and I think I can do the research well. Fair enough. It's a very pragmatic answer. <laughs> Tanya, have you thought of any questions at all or should we wrap it up? Thank Sean for his time. I think we should probably go ahead and wrap it up. But Sean, thank you so much. This has been fascinating. And the history of Baptists in North Carolina is just a fascinating topic. And I just always think how many dissertation topics and book topics there are for people. One last thing I'd, I'd like to say, so I noticed uh, Julie Vito's on this call, so she was our editor, um, so I'd have a lot more spelling mistakes and grammar typos without Julie, so just a thank you, shout out to her since she's here today. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, you all, the link to purchase the book was in the chat box. Um, you can grab that right now, or you can visit Wake Forest Baptist Church's um, website, order it from them. Um, we also have a few copies at the museum. All of the all of the proceeds, we send the check right to the church. So what, whatever is um, easiest for you, we'd love to get your hands on a copy of this book. Thank you, Sean. All right, thanks for your time, everyone. Thank thanks you. We'll send the link out soon. <laughs>